we just wanted to share a little bit about the miracle of, of Christmas. You see, the, the, the play that the kids had shows us, yeah, that Christmas isn't just about the birth of Jesus. It's very much connected to the death of Jesus as well. So hey, you see that the miracle of Christmas is this. Like we talked about earlier today, the creator of the universe breaking into time and space, being born as a baby. And we say, why? Why would God have to become man? Why would he become a baby? And, and yes, it was to reveal to us the Father. We learn about God's love for us. Yes, it was to show us what the Father is like, to show us how to live. But you see, the baby Jesus was born in order to die for you and for me. And why is that? Because you see, we needed a rescuer. You see, uh, Tim, do you have the slides back? I don't think I have my phone on me to do the slides. Maybe I do. Let's see. You see, in, uh, there we go. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, as, as, as people, when we do wrong things, anytime we say, think, or do something wrong, or don't do the right thing, that's sin. It means to miss the mark of God's perfection. And because of that, Scripture is really clear that, that that means that we deserve death because sin separates us from God, who's the creator and sustainer of all of life. But, but this verse also says, so you know, the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death, but there's a gift. It's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and we may say, well, well, if we deserve death, then, then how can the gift be given? Well, let's keep listening you know, we may say, well, you know what? I, I feel like I'm a pretty good person. Like, like I don't do that, that much wrong things. Like, I, I really try my best to be good. What does Scripture say about that? Can we look at the passage from the book of Galatians chapter 3? You see, the Apostle Paul says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. The, the Bible says that we're under a curse if we can't do everything exactly right. If we can't keep the whole law, then, then we're under a curse. So Paul says, look, nobody's justified. Nobody's declared righteous before God by the law. Rather, the righteous will live by faith. It's like what Elsie said. It's about believing. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. And then here's the good news in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us you see god became man and in him becoming man he now identified with humanity who owed the sin debt god became man and as he hung on that tree it says cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree christ redeemed us in order that the blessings given to abraham might come to gentiles those that are not christian not, not jews through christ jesus so again by faith we might receive the promise of the spirit you see, Christ had to come and be a human because in doing so, he identified with all of us. He now could pay that debt. And you see, we look on the cross and we see Jesus on the cross. All of your sin and my sin was put on him. And he received the just punishment that we deserve. He received all of it. But here's the thing. He was fully man, so he could say, yes, I owe this debt. I, I can pay this debt. But because he is fully God, he received that. And yes, he died, but he rose from the dead. And he is bigger than the punishment. You see, Jesus had to become man so he could pay the debt. And yet, because he is fully God, he destroyed the punishment that we deserved. Uh, it, it's kind of like this. We could illustrate it like this. See this book here? Let's pretend that this book is a record of my life, a record of every sin I've ever committed. Okay, anytime I've said, thought, or done something against God's will, or I failed to do the right thing, okay? If I, uh, so by the time I turned 70 years old, let's just say hypothetically, I only did one of each of those sins every day. I only sinned four times a day. By the time I got to be 70, there'd be over 100,000 entries in this book. I've never had that good of a day in my life, okay? <laughs> now, so this is, this is my sin. So, so here is me, okay? This hand represents me, and this hand represents God. And if I want to get to God, there is something in the way. What's in the way? My sin. You see, but when God 
became man, Jesus. Okay, so we got me with my sin and Jesus here. On the cross, Jesus took my sin as if it was his. So now where is my sin? It's on Jesus. Is it because I'm good enough? Is it because I did anything special? No, it's because he took it for me. And it says that he took the punishment, and when he rose from the dead, the sin was gone. It's not there anymore, okay? So now, to anybody who would believe, we can be reconciled to God and receive eternal life. That's what Christmas is all about. You see, Christmas is about the love that God has for us. In the book of John, and then also in the book of 1 John, it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever, anybody, whoever would believe in Him, would not perish, but have eternal life. And later on, in the book of 1 John, John says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. You see, when we talk about becoming a Christian, we talk about being saved, it's to believe. And belief is something that can happen without words. It's trusting. It'd be like if, uh, well, I, I have this chair over here. Sorry, I'm going to come down here and grab this. I've got this chair right here. And if I believe in this chair, if I believe, it's a little rickety, okay? But if I believe that this chair will hold me, then I can put my full weight into this chair and I can lean back, and I can rest in the chair. You see, this is an example of what it means to believe and trust. It means, Jesus, you died in my place, and I trust that that sacrifice is enough to forgive all my sin, and I trust you. And that's what it means to become a Christian, to put your full weight into, I can't save myself, but you can save me, Jesus. And I want to end with this story from Scripture, from the book of Luke. Because you know what, maybe you're here today and you feel like God loves me. I don't know. Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I've been through? Maybe you feel far from God today. And I want you to hear this story that Jesus shared in the book of Luke chapter 15. So Tim, if you want to skip ahead to Luke, the slide, Luke 15. You see, Jesus told this story because the Pharisees were there and they were kind of mad at him because they're like, You're hanging out with sinners. You're hanging out with all these outcasts. Why are you doing that? And Jesus told three stories. He said, look, uh, uh, if a shepherd has 100 sheep and he counts them and he gets 99, 99, counts them again, 99, he's missing one. He says, will he not go and leave the 99 to go find the one? And when he finds them, he rejoices over that one. And he says, look, I tell you, in heaven there's more rejoicing over one sinner who repents than, than all the righteous people who didn't need that. Then he tells a story. Suppose a lady had, had 10 coins, and she loses one of them. He says, won't she sweep the whole house to find her golden coin? And when she finds it, she rejoices. I've lost it. You see, God is a God who seeks and searches. And then he told them this story. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me sh- my share of the estate. So he divided the property among them. This son is basically saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I just want your stuff. Give me my inheritance. And the father does, divides his inheritance out. He keeps two-thirds of the inheritance for the older son and gives the younger son one-third. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and squandered his wealth and wild living. After he spent everything, there was a se- severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. Pigs are unclean to the Jews the lowest of the low. And get this, he longed even to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This son that had everything, Dad, I just wish you were dead. I just want your stuff. Goes out, wastes it all. And he's at a place where he's so low where he looks at pig slop and he goes, that looks tasty. I need that. I need that food. And then the story kind of takes a turn. Verse 17, he came to his senses and said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I got it. I'll set out. I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your servants. Like, Dad, I messed up. 
I, I can't even be your son anymore. Just, I just want to be a servant. Just take care of me. So he got up and went to his father. And I'm sure he's rehearsing this the whole way. I'm sorry, I sinned, I messed up. I can't be your son, I just want to be a servant. But get this, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Look, sometimes we may feel that God is waiting with a stick. Because we know our mistakes. And we think he's just waiting with a stick. To, hey, we deserve it. Look at the father here in this story. The father is God in the story. And this is what he says. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arm around him, and, ki- and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He's going into that pre-planned apology, and the, and the father's not even hearing it. Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's celebrate. We'll have a feast. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Look, if you feel like you are far away from God, God is not waiting with a stick. He is that father of compassion. You see, old men didn't run back in the day. Maybe that's still true today. I don't know yet. Okay? But they didn't have pants like this, right? They had those robes that the kids had. So if you wanted to run, you had to hike up your robe and run. Can you picture the humiliation of that, that father booking it out to his son? But he didn't care. He didn't care that he had squandered everything. He said, I just want you to come home. There's a song I used to listen to when I was in college called Whatever Reason by Disciple. And, and it's about this story of the prodigal son. And this is what it says. This is God the Father talking. Whatever reason you've been running... I just don't care anymore. Already forgotten whatever happened with what went wrong. I just want you to come home. And then it goes to the bridge and it says, I see something far away. Could this be the day to take you in these arms and wash all the wasted days and years away just to see the eyes of my beloved child? Now I'm running. I'm the one that's running. That is is the heart of the Father who sent His Son Jesus to be born, to die for you and for me. And if you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, or maybe you have and you've kind of just drifted away, God is there waiting and seeking you. And He says, I just want you to come home. And when you get to that place where you say, I need that love of the Father, I know I'm not perfect. I deserve the wages of my sin. The Father beckons you and he says, all you need to do is trust me. So this morning, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, or maybe you've wandered away and you want to put your faith in Jesus, it's as simple as, and you can pray this prayer in your heart with me, Lord, I know that I (laughs) do wrong things. And I need a rescuer. And you, Jesus, died for me. And I don't understand it all, but, but that death is enough to forgive all my sin, past, present, and future. And I need that. So in my heart, I just trust you. I put my full weight into you. I put my full weight into you. And I trust you to save me. And if that's you today, then I encourage you, talk to me afterwards. Because you see, God loves you so very much. He sent his son, Jesus, to die in your place. Because he wants that relationship with you that begins today and goes for all of eternity. So thank you so much for being here today. Let's close in a word of prayer. And we'll give those kids out there high fives and hugs. Again, if that was you today, that you want to make a decision for Jesus, or you just want to know more, talk to me. Because God loves you so much. Lord, we thank you for Christmas. That you would become a human to save a sinner like me. Thank you. Draw our hearts to you. We trust you. We love you. Thank you for those kids out there. God bless them. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for coming. God bless you. Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next week.